go. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, today is, uh, we're in June, June Free Press Salon. June, uh, what is today, the 11th? Yes, yeah. yeah, June 11th, uh, uh, 2022, and uh, we're down with the free press down at the uh, Columbus Arts Festival. We're trying to do a uh, peace and democracy uh, salon, where we're going to have some folks work that were working on the uh, Columbus City Council uh, Charter Review, and also we're doing a big reflection on uh, what happened in 1982. Some of us folks may on the line have been part of that. But um, when we did a special march, we had 10 buses from Columbus go that march. It was a march on the United Nations for the special session to, uh, on disarmament. When the, the, the global nuclear freeze movement was going on, we uh, sent 10 buses as, as uh, representatives from Columbus, Ohio. We have Mike Gruber. Oh. Uh -oh. Seem to have lost Mark. I'll see if he can. Uh, Mark, you got to check your audio. Unmute. Okay. Oh, there we go. Somehow it went crazy. All right. Thank you. All right. So we're going to look for. Uh, I, I don't see who's on right now. But uh, we're going to wait a little bit. Uh, we have Bill is on, I know. And uh, I don't see, oh, Jonathan's on. So we might start with the charter review folks first. And then when uh, Mike gets on, we'll talk a little bit about the reflection of the 40, 40 years ago and June 12th, which is uh, tomorrow, June 12th, 40 years ago, we had a million people march in the streets of New York City uh, calling for a nuclear disarmament. And uh, again, we spent 10 buses that went from Columbus, Ohio. So it was called the Big Spring Peace Push at that point. So there we are. Uh, we're going to try to do a little reflection on that. But also there's some serious discussions on what does it take to create peace right now when we have seven wars going on in the world right now. Uh, we always hear about Ukraine, but uh, there's several, Cameroon, Somalia, uh, Yemen, uh, on and on and on. There's wars all over the place. So, um, oh, good. Mike's on too. So, Mike, what's your your schedule? You're okay. Hang on for a little bit. Let uh, Bill and, and Jonathan go, or do you want to go first? Make good? a difference. Okay. Yep. All right. All right. So, why don't we let Bill and, and uh, because this is sort of a continuation of a conversation we've had the last two two uh, salons. The city council is going through some changes. Uh, as everybody knows, we voted to, to increase up to nine council members. Uh, but uh, as part of that, there was some reviewing of what the charter actually means. And they've been very restrictive on who's been uh, participating in those conversations and what kind of uh, uh, direction we might be going. So Bill, why don't you catch us up on that and where you're going and Jonathan's on here too. So the two of you tag team for about 15 minutes and then. Uh, we'll, we'll move on to a uh, board discussion. Thank you. Okay, sure. Thanks, everyone. Uh, just to update you that um, every, what, eight years now, the Columbus uh, has uh, uh, appoints a charter review commission to look at our city charter, which is like our city constitution. Uh, and uh, the last one was 2014, and now it's 2022. And so they're all appointed to from the city council, uh, to from the mayor, and then the chair is appointed uh, from both. So that's perhaps one problem is uh, that, that. But anyhow, so they have had since January seven meetings uh, before they had a public uh, hearing. And in those hearings, they were a captured audience by the city officials presenting uh, mostly the city attorney's office, but the mayor and uh, auditor and others, what they wanted to see changed in the city charter. Well, were the people, you know, the people really weren't participating at all. And so they had as long as they wanted to. And finally, they said, okay, we'll have a public hearing then after 
seven of them. And they were going to limit our testimony to three minutes. And I wrote back, I said, are you people crazy? You know, do you say you say you want to hear from the people you've had seven meetings? So anyhow, so I uh, testified in person. Uh, jo uh, Joe Motil did. I know uh, John uh, Beard uh, sent in testimony, Carolyn Harding and Sandy Bozinius. And then uh, there was one other person online there. And I don't know who else sent in public testimony. So several things that they've been uh, looking at. Well, the one that we were most concerned about because of issue seven last year on the November ballot that the city got up in arms uh, about the so-called green energy initiative that was going to take what, $87 million from uh, the city funds for so-called green initi uh, initiatives, that um, it was soundly defeated by the voters, 87% to 13. So, you know, why, why is the city so worried about it? But of course, they, they, they wanted to use that as an opportunity to uh, try to further squash uh, all citizen initiatives, because I think the city attorney's office would not like to deal with uh, true democracy of the people. And so they, it's a, they see it as a hassle for them. And so Columbus has been not friendly to citizen initiatives. So, okay, they put in some provisions that mirrored the state to try to deal with what they called self-dealing measures. So to make it much harder, so voters would have to pass two uh, uh, things on the ballot to approve a so-called self-dealing measure like issue seven was where people can uh, get money. So anyhow, uh, I don't think it's necessary, but what we were most alarmed about, first of all, is then they said, well, let's use the fake city council districts, the nine districts, which aren't real districts because Jonathan, I'll let him talk more about that, that they're still going to voted, be voted on at large. Uh, they're going to. They wanted to use those to uh, that we had to get a certain percentage of signatures from five out of nine of these districts that are going to take an effect next year. So uh, that right away, I said, "Yeah, are you, nobody does that. There, there's no need for it, uh, and it's going to be an extreme burden on citizen initiatives that are already." very hard to get on the ballot initiatives like our group, Columbus Community Bill of Rights. Okay, so at least we had, we've been playing defense so far. Well, in our, but so we had some def, uh, uh, victory that uh, in their last meeting, they, after the seven meetings, then they had a public hearing, then they had two more meetings. They voted to uh, reject uh, that part of the Zach Klein's office, uh, uh, you know, proposal to include districts in the signatures for uh, citizen initiatives. So we're thankful for, for that. So they have another meeting coming up on June 22nd. Then they're going to have another public hearing. They haven't said the actual date yet, but they said in the last meeting it would be June 29th or 30th. And then uh, J July 4th, the Charter Review Commission meets again, and then they finalize, so there isn't much time left, but then they finalize their recommendations to City Council, it has to be sent to them by July 10th, and then by July uh, 20, uh, uh, 5th or uh, 26th, it's, uh, or 25th is the last day the City Council can pass uh, and, and accept what they have or reject some of it and put it on the ballot. So now that, uh, you know, in the testimony that I'm going to give, I just want to just say a couple things and then I'll let uh, Jonathan uh, talk about it, that first of all, thank them for listening to the citizens who said, we don't want that uh, proposal about another requirement on signatures using these fake districts. Uh, but They've only adopted things from the city officials. So we say, well, this is our opportunity, the citizens of Columbus to say, what do we want in this charter? What do we want changed that's gonna make it more just, more democratic for the people? Well, just to go further with initiatives, they put in this one year requirement which screwed our group from 
you know, we were nine months into our campaign and uh, the COVID happened. And uh, the city didn't give us uh, any remedy for that. And we naturally couldn't keep collecting signatures during COVID, uh, risking our health and, and the public's, but the city said it's tough. So that's one reason we want to have the one year requirement removed. So we want them to do that. And no other city has this in Ohio, and neither does the state. So this was another thing that was done in 2014, wrapped up in a bunch of other uh, things they put on the ballot. Voters probably weren't even aware it was passed. And, and there are other things about it, uh, like the city attorney's office having a time limit. There's right now, there's no limit for the city attorney to rule on if a, a, a submitted petition uh, meets the single subject requirement and form requirement. And that just eats into the time that people have to collect signatures, unless they remove the one year requirement and don't have, have any. So here's how, uh, like I said, this is something that there's a lot going on, but where we all can have the most effect is locally first. Think globally, but have it locally, because this is what governs uh, things. And they have had uh, uh, not just about initiative, they've had some things about who's going to be the mayor, uh, acting as mayor if the mayor is incapacitated. They've had things on the open meetings, uh, uh, rules that they want to change, uh, public servants, they've got some rules changed. So there are other things, but the charter is very expansive. So we can pick things from that, that, and I'll put in links to the Charter Review Commission uh, timeline and them, and even to the city code that goes to where initiatives are. So you can look at, at those there. So here's what you can do. Number one, if you uh, are interested, uh, we, uh, you can uh, testify in person which would be on the 29th or 30th. And well, we can let you know as soon as possible when that is. Um, and you can also testify at the, when the city council finally meets on this is July 25th. If you don't wanna testify in person, you can do it virtually. If you don't wanna do that, you can submit written testimony and I'll put the, uh, uh, the uh, email link to that too uh, here when I'm done. And uh, or you can just show up in support uh, uh, when the uh, meetings are taking place. Like I said, uh, July, or sorry, June uh, 29th or 30th, and then uh, July uh, 25th would be probably, I think, the last meeting when that would be at the city council meeting, too. So these are ways to get involved. And like I said, if there are other things, you can you know, listen to our recommendations. And John, I'll let you, you go now. And, but if there are other things that you think that should be changed in the city charter, and I don't wanna take all the time, but there are other things I'd like to see change, uh, you can do so. So John, I'll let you uh, add what you want to. Thanks much. Um, first, uh, thanks to the Free Press and, and um, uh, Mark, thank you much. Um, and thank you, Bill, for keeping an eye on this because Bill has really been tracking the stuff and alerting us to what's going on. Um, this is another, you know, bullshit city process, okay, with a hand-picked group of people, you know, they're little toadies to do exactly what the city wants them to do. Um, it's a self-serving process, and as um, Bill said, city staff has been leading this group by the nose, just feeding them what they want to be fed, things that the city wants. This, this is nothing that reflects anything that's um, good for the people or good for, you know, good for um, democracy. So just kind of to give you a little bit of um, the last time they did a um, Charter Review Commission was after Citizens in 2015, we got, for the first time ever, Citizens initiated an amendment, Charter Amendment, got it on the ballot, and it was defeated in a special election in August 2015. That was the first time in Columbus's 100-year charter history that Citizens had ever, had ever gotten a Charter Amendment on the ballot. Then they went about making Charter Amendments harder. Actually, before that, in 2014, we um, got enough signatures for um, um, some council reform things for um, you know, council elections and, and um, campaign finance reform. And they tossed that off the ballot, um, didn't let us get on the ballot. Let's see, so the last time I did this process, again, we did little toadies. So it was chaired by Stephanie Coe, who was a um, Southwest Area Commissioner. And Stephanie then immediately applied for council, for the council vacancy that went to um, um, the boy from um, 
Nick, not Nick, um, the guy from Morse Pro, Emmanuel Remy. Oh yeah. That was time periods right after the right after their charter review commission left. Right. Stephanie applied for that, and so did Kiri McCarthy, who's also on this board as well. Um, and Lourdes, Lourdes um, De Padilla was also a member of that commission, and now she's on council. So you get these people who have ambitions of being on council to do what council wants them to do. Um, let's see. So last time around, you get, again, they were responding to citizens putting a proposal for two council districts on the ballot. And they promised us that this commission would be informed by experts and they would um, do things in public as opposed to our ballot committee, which was you know, five members that, that did things in this committee. And they would be they would put best practices forward. Well, then they came up with this um, shitty ass bizarre proposal for these fake council districts, which are the council members have to live in one of nine areas, but they're still voted on citywide. And I mean, such a bizarre proposal is only practiced in three other American cities, Reno and Sparks, um, Nevada, and Tucson, Arizona. At the time they were up there promoting it as the best practice. It was being sued in Tucson under the Voting Rights Act. And so the, Reno, so the Nevada State Legislature was at the time rewriting the Reno and Sparks charters. And all that was public knowledge. The Legal Defense Fund had come to town. Uh, nobody from council would meet with the Legal Defense Fund, so they swapped letters. And this is the time when we got a majority black city council. So anytime they're looking to fuck over black folk, they put black folk in charge of it. <laughs> Gets to this committee as well. Um, but nobody from council would meet with the, the LDF. Um, so they swapped letters. And the LDF said, you know, this bizarre form of government would continue to diminish the voters, the voices of black voters, um, under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Section two of the Voting Rights Act um, says that geographically concentrated minorities have a constitutional right to elect candidates of their own choosing without having their votes diluted in the larger pool of voters. Okay, and that's the problem with that large vote. So you've got, you know, black neighborhoods that can't elect their own representatives without the concurrence of the white majority. Um, so anyway, this time around, Trudy Bartley, a black woman who's you know a, a city favorite, she worked at the city hall for decades. Now she's Ohio State Vice President of Government Affairs. She chairs the commission. Um, you know, she's one of the um, establishment Negroes. And um, Nana Watson from the NAACP is also on the commission and two other black folk. So you got four out of five of the members are black, which should immediately raise suspicions that something's going on here because that is an unlikely combination of five people in Columbus. Um, and the biggest issue has been this, you know, this um, whether or not the Columbus uh, former government is racially discriminatory and should be changed. That's been the biggest issue that I've been aware of. So they put four blacks on this five person commission to ignore that issue. So if you look at the city's charter review website, it says it'll do a comprehensive review of the charter, comprehensive and public. As Bill explained, it has not been public with one out of nine meetings having public input. And it's not been comprehensive because they've been leading them by the nose and they haven't even talked about you know, council districts, which has the, the only thing citizens have brought to council, put on the ballot for the first time in 100 years, was council districts. It's the only thing a national organization, you know, the voting rights experts, Legal Defense Fund, who all their asses owe their jobs to, um, um, you know, came to town and commented on. They wouldn't take, you know, public testimony from the LDF. LDF was in town three times. LDF said they would come to a hearing. Uh, they wouldn't be invited to a hearing. So anyway, it's, it's this thing is just, it's just a mess as always. So from my standpoint, I'm still pushing back on their fake districts saying, you know, they put together a bizarre proposal that was nowhere near the best practice that, that they um, that they promised, um, that it doesn't serve the, you know, the voting rights needs of, of African Americans here in Columbus. And let's not get confused by the fact that we had a majority black city council, okay? Those folks are selected. You know, as you all know, they're all appointed to um, their seats. And then they run for election first time with business money and, and the party endorsement. That's not the same as black folk having a vote. You know, those are better votes for, for the downtown business community than they are for black Columbus. And I could lead you through a hundred different examples of, of, of you know, how, how I would prove that. Um, let's see, in any case, we got this terrible form of government that's structurally designed to put the most electorally and financially weak candidates in office. So they will do as they are told to do. Uh, which is bad for everybody. And now we've got this majority black um, um, charter review commission that's going to sign off on that. It's going to check it. They're not going to review it again. They're not, so they're going to check off on it and say it's okay because the last charter review commission looked at it. That's to me an un, um, untenable outcome, and I've let them know that. 
um, as black folk is embarrassing to be in Columbus. Um, the other big issue Bill alluded to was a single subject provision of the charter. They put that in the charter after you put um, after you put the, tried to put things on the ballot with council reforms. And um, Bob was actually our they, then they kicked our 2017 ballot issue off the um, off. We got enough signatures. They wouldn't vote to send it to the Board of Elections because uh, Zach had said or um, 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 Rick Pfeiffer had said it violates a single subject provision. So the single subject provision comes straight from the state constitution. Okay, the wording is exactly the same as in the state constitution. It's what they put in the city charter. There's a lot of case law about it at the, at the state level, and um, so essentially single subject at the, at the state level. This case law says it's not designed to preclude comprehensive legislation on a single general area. It should not be construed to make petitioners have to um, submit multiple ballot initiatives on something that's a similar concept. It's designed to address disunity rather than a plurality of issues, okay? So that's what this case law says. So it got, kept us off the ballot. We sued. We lost in a 4-5 decision in the Supreme Court. Um, the fifth judge said um, cities didn't have a right to kick us off, but we didn't argue that point. Um, but essentially what the Supreme Court said was that case law doesn't matter, that the city attorney can decide what's in the subject, which is about as undemocratic as you can be that the city attorney can decide what citizens put on our own ballot. Um, the other piece with that, as Bill alluded to, is um, there's no time limit for the city attorney to conduct his review. So the process is you submit your um, pre-circulation petition to the city, then the city attorney reviews it as to form, and form includes single subject. There's no time limit on there. So he's actually been sitting on, uh, we submitted a rent proposal petition. He's been sitting on that for six weeks now Okay, the clock on the one year clock started ticking six weeks ago. He's sitting on it with, you know, he's just playing games at this point. Doesn't want to see it on the ballot, but wants to wants to ensure it doesn't get on a particular ballot. He's just sitting on it. So for us to go out and start collecting signatures right now, when you can come back and say, no, this violates single subject is um is stupid. Mm -hmm. So what we're asking also is for the city to get that single subject rule out of there or to put a time limit, a 10 day time limit for that review or the city loses standing to, um, to claim single subject. Um, we're talking about another, another piece I'm asking for is elections by true district, get rid of this bizarre thing. And then for um, the city council to have anybody appointed to a position, to a council, to a vacant council position, be a disqualified placeholder, ineligible to run the next election. So we don't have these, you know, appointed incumbents that become, you know, that, that are essentially placeholder, placeholders for us. So those are my um, kind of my issues. Um, then the other piece I would say is, it does the um, public trust. The, the idea behind the Citizens Commission is that it's supposed to give you trust in what's coming out of the government. It does no good. You get no public trust in it when all these folks are trying to get appointed to city council or something like that. So they should be disqualified from serving in you know city government or being hired for a period of time. Um, let's see. Again, this one, we've got Kerry McCarthy, who already applied for, who applied last time around for city council job. On the Citizens Review Commission, another thing is having former city employees, okay? Um, you have um, again, Michael Kassler, I think, chaired the Citizen Re Compensation Review Committee that proposed that 60% raise for Shannon Harden, and the, you know, 40% raise for somebody else and 20% raise. You know, that having all these insiders doesn't do anything to promote public confidence. Um, so one thing, we're actually toying around with the submitting a petition to um, a proposal to end these citizen commissions because they're, they're not serving the public any good. You know, I don't think anybody on here believes that Shannon Harden deserves a 60% raise on top of his cost of living adjustment after council raises were already done like three years ago or two years ago. So anyway, they're, they're just huge issues with this stuff. And thank you, Bill, for um, bringing it to you know, a group of our attention and for promoting this issue. And I just encourage everybody to, you know, stay on top of it, register your disapproval. Again, from my standpoint, council districts, disqualified placeholders, um, and um, what was the third one I said? And these commissions are probably the big, oh, and the single subject rule are probably mm -hmm. the big things because they're just mm -hmm. completely undemocratic, all of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you want just one more thing, if you want more information that's going to be up to date bef uh, shortly before the 
uh, next public hearing, uh, we, Columbus Community Bill of Rights, is going to have a booth at ComFest, and, and we're taking this up as one of our issues, and we will have some uh, palm cards as well as a QR code where you can go to a website with some of our recommendations that you can also read, and if you agree with them, you can submit uh, your comments. So thank you. So speaking of ConFest, um, the Citizen Petition for Rent Control has a booth at ConFest as well. Now, the interesting thing is um, last week, the Ohio General Assembly passed a law prohibiting rent control in Ohio, so they preempted it. We had some provisions in there, some kind of poison pills in our um, proposal, anticipating that. Um, but looking at the language, again, we think there's this kind of a way around it that, we'll, um, that we're going to probably propose as well. But we'll be there at Compass as well. And, um, you know, again, with this um, Ohio General Assembly, you know, we got to get these assholes out of here, out of there. I met, I um, had the unfortunate meeting with two representatives from Western Ohio um, as part of my job over the last couple of weeks. And these guys are batshit crazy. And, you know, I think if the Ohio Democratic Party had been on their job, there's a special election for um, state offices or state rep and senator on August 2nd. They're expecting a two or 3% turnout. And, you know, that's like two or 300 votes will win an election. And I wish to God the Ohio Democratic Party had been on its case and had been seeding candidates into these um, into these races, and then telling Democrats, don't worry about voting for a Democrat. Anybody on the Democratic side is going to be sane, but let's get together and get, you know, let's decide who the Republican nominee for the um, general election will be. I wish to God they had done that, because, um, you know, especially because this General Assembly, the one seated, will be the ones that does the redistricting for the next 10 years, right? So we still got a map to draw. And, uh, I don't know. Jonathan, Thanks, you guys. This might Thanks, be going guys. out on the radio, so if you guys try to keep the swearing down, will you please? <laughs> yeah, we're we're getting close to that. Um, yeah, thanks, Jonathan, Bill. Um, yeah, I anticipate you guys to stay in in touch and and keep updating us. And please, more people get involved with going down to city council now that COVID is starting to come out. It's more of a of an ability to get down there and engage in public uh, intercourse, <laughs> discourse. Uh, <laughs> With, uh, with the folks. Uh, so I would say thanks, Bill and Jonathan, uh, for your work. Uh, uh, that is, this is a perfect example of, do we have democracy in the United States? Uh, since Citizen United and many other court decisions has really started creating a whole different uh, environment for how people are um, not uh, the voice, it's money that's the voice. And, and democracy, it's not the rule of people, it's the rule of, uh, of money. So kleptocracy is what we're about right now. So um, some people are asking about Confess and thank you guys for mentioning that there are booths that you can jump in on. There is no booth for free, pre uh, free press nor uh, disco this year, um, but I think maybe uh, Disco may be doing some informational stuff, but no wine booth. So please find a local organization and join in if you can to join some of those booths at ComFest, as well as Pride Festival next week. Um, join in and try to really make those things as much as we can, uh, points of public discourse. Uh, so thank you again, guys, at WGRN, WCRS, um, as well, have booths as well. Um, down at, uh, so we need people to help volunteer at ComFest. So please come by and, and sign up as you can uh, that week. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Um, now I'd like to sort of segue over, unless other folks have any, uh, burning questions about that particular issues. Uh, I'd like to segue over to um, Mike. Thank you, who is that volunteering? Um, I'd like to segue over to Michael Gruber, who was big time part of the Big Spring Peace Push, which was a, a coalition of folks that were uh, pushing to do peace work in the early 80s, 1982. He was subsequently the president of Columbus Campaign for Arms Control, which is one of our oldest uh, uh, peace organizations in town, um, organized in 1977, eight and uh, was really pushing for the uh, nuclear weapons freeze campaign back then. And that was one of the issues uh, 
one thing about the June 12, 1982 action, it nearly broke down days before because uh, the traditionalist peace activists were very unwilling to uh, uh, expand the mention of funding human needs. And so ultimately that was brought in. So it was disarmament and fund human needs. So Michael, are you ready to jump on and, and uh, give us a little reflection on that? And I know you may have some video and, and or pictures that you might want to share as well. Well, I didn't have time to go through my okay, extensive archives to- You got extensions, <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> but I do, I do have a few pictures of uh, buttons and a couple posters and t-shirts if I, I don't know if I can share the screen or- Steve, Steven, can you give Michael that permission, please? Yeah, I think you can, try it. Thank you, thank you. Uh, let's see. You see it, it's coming out soon. <laughs> All I see is white. <laughs> yeah, I only see white too. Is that, is that the, uh, the the sign of truth? I think you shared the whiteboard. You have to uh, click yeah, on your- You might've just, make I sure said, you're sharing the right screen. Share the right screen, yeah. Let's try this. Okay, uh, can you see that? Yes, perfect, thank you. Okay, there, there's the, uh, was one of the uh, promotional posters for the event that, uh, you know, it's got the peace dove marching uh, with a, a diverse uh, group of legs there. That was uh, sort of a fun poster. Yeah. Uh, the June 12th rally was probably, it's, was definitely the largest uh, anti-nuclear rally in U.S. history. Uh, all the estimates from the police as well as the organizers were at least a million people marched that day and filled uh, Central Park. The uh, June 14th uh, e event was you know, called Blockade the Bomb Makers. And there were affinity groups from all over the country that uh, agreed to take part in civil dis disobedience actions at the, the UN missions uh, for the you know, Soviet, American, and uh, all the nuclear nations. Uh, I got to partake in that as well as the March on the 12th. And I had, had the distinction of getting arrested twice in one day, once at the UN, US UN mission and the uh, Soviet. UN mission. Uh, the, they thought they were intimidating us by uh, taking us after the first arrest to, to Harlem for processing in the court. And what, what actually happened was all the, all the people in the neighborhood came out and wondered, who are all these folks they're bringing in in buses? And uh, you know, as soon as we got out, we were out on the street sitting on the, the brownstone uh, steps and you know talking with folks in the neighborhood about the the links between uh, the the nuclear industry and the nuclear bombs being sucking up the uh, the budget versus uh, funding human needs. So that was a, a really neat experience that a lot of us had. That uh, you know New York's a big city and not everybody from the city was was in. Uh, in the park on, on June 12th, but by them taking us to Harlem, it sort of, you know, spread, spread the word to the various neighborhoods. Uh, there were a lot of different buttons from the day I collect buttons. <laughs> this is only a couple that I picked up uh, those days. Uh, that, that's the, the logo for the Big Spring Peace Push which was a, a really good uh, coalition of local activists and groups that came together. And, and we brought about a, a series of events to, to lead up to the June 12th rally and to organize for it. Uh, we organized buses to go from Columbus, but you know, the, we made a conscious effort to try and you know, not, not just say, oh, come to, come to New York City, but to, to have a series of events and speakers and things that we did, you know, did here locally and tried to 
uh, you know, bridge a lot of groups working together. Mark, it's, you can speak up if you want to about some of the other groups that were involved. Yeah, there were, there was quite a few. There were labor, uh, faith organizations, other peace organizations. It was it was a very wide wide broth of, or swath of of uh, community folks. We were meeting mainly at St. Stephen's Episcopal Church, right. but we also had several uh, organizational meetings on the east side in Old First Presbyterian Church as well as many other uh, uh, other organizational uh, uh, locations across across town. And yeah, as Mike said, the big push there was to really pull more than just the, the, the concept of being involved in this one march, but that it, it was calling people to come out and be part of. And we led in to the next few years of being the second largest uh, organized state behind California of organizations throughout Ohio. We had people doing organizing for peace uh, in, in the smallest of towns to the biggest of cities in Ohio through, throughout the 80s, uh, 85. That did start moving in from just peace uh, work to, to I mean, uh, anti-nuclear work to also then moving into uh, Central America and, and Middle East work as well and, and, and culminated into a big action in 1987 when uh, uh, we did big action. We shut down CIA that day after the big action we had in D.C. Uh, up and down the mall. Uh, we then the next day, similar to what did, happened in 82, when on the 12th was the big action. But then on the 14th, I, too, was part of uh, uh, the blockading of the embassies and uh, Israel, uh, Soviet Union, um, uh, uh, U.S., uh, uh, China and um, uh India and one other one that was out there. I, France, I that I believe. Right. Yeah, France. France was the other one. Yeah. Uh, we're all part of the coalition's effort to, to bring a, a close to the city and to business as usual. So, um, yeah, Mike, thank you for yeah, reflecting we, on that. Yeah, yeah we, we also you know, were able to you know, point out the connections to the nuclear industry, you know, in our own, own community, you know, from Battelle uh to uh you know nuclear uh or the fuels for cruise missiles that ashland chemicals was was doing and uh you know tried tried to you know, bring it to a community level as well as mark said uh the, the, this is the the summons i got uh i believe from <laughs> my my second arrest on the 14th we were all carrying carrying flowers that day, so I framed it with my uh, my summons from the day. Very nice. Yes. And I could end end the the sharing there. Fantastic. Yeah, there, there's a certain Michael. Can you talk a little bit about the the the? I don't know if it's emotion or if it's a political liberation feel when you actually make that decision to do disobedience. So there, there's a I, well, it's 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 a I've very it's a very many different times. Yeah. It's a very empowering uh, thing, especially the the first few times you do it. I mean, you're you're uh, putting yourself on the line. Uh, you're in an affinity group. Uh, you're meeting people from across the country that are also participating in it. Uh, you get your your moment in the in the in the courtroom where you get to explain why you did it, even though they don't want you to explain why you're doing it and you know, making those connections between uh, the, the money, especially during the Reagan years, which this was, uh, that was, Reagan was wanting to build up the nuclear arsenal and you know, put more money into defense. And you know, we were, again, as Mark said, we're making those connections between funding human needs over over uh, nuclear arsenals. Uh, it, it's real interesting because I'm sure a lot of people have been involved in coalitions through the years. And, and you, you have that sense of people coming together and building, and then you have the big event. And to, to try and keep that momentum going, uh, it's hard to do it at the same level. 
uh, through Columbus campaign for arms control. Uh, I think we did as good a job as we could of, you know, keeping the community informed, uh, you know, going to ComFest every year, and, you know, we'd have our petitions and sell our buttons that uh, help, help fund the organization. I do want to make a shout out for folks volunteering at ComFest this year. After two years of COVID, it's been difficult. We're not seeing as many people going online and signing up, especially for safety, cleanup and recycling, and, and other, other groups. If uh, anybody would like to help out with safety, you can email me at safety at comfest.com or go directly to comfest.com and go to the volunteer link. Uh, it's, it's gotten more difficult through the years. I mean, Comfest was founded on community groups coming together to celebrate activism. And, you know, we've always had, had it where if you volunteered, had your volunteers put in hours, then the booth was free. But, you know, the community organizations have had a harder time even to have a booth and have enough people to cover the booth. So, I mean, it's, it's sort of a, you know, it's been difficult through the years to see, you know, groups we'd like to see at ComFest not be there. But, uh, you know, that's a whole nother topic. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, thanks, Mike. We, yeah, we, that, that, yeah. That's, that's for sure that we need a shout out and really um, uh, be able to support ComFest. And, and, the, and the groups that do have tables there this year to you know, put in some time with them, as, as the other folks were saying, uh, so that they can participate in some of the workshops. We've got a, a series of workshops that uh, we wish we had more. We wish we had more speakers that could you know, do a 10 minute, 15 minute talk from the stages. Uh, we've had a hard time pulling people uh, that want to do that. Well, thank you for uh, letting me reminisce on 40 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but Michael, your your uh, your leadership through CCAC and the Big Spring Push it was very important and critical, and I've always appreciated your friendship and and your continued work with Compass is very important. And and, same, same and to actually, you, Mark. <laughs> actually, he he was the the he's the insurance guy, so he was the insurance guy that uh, was able to. Uh, figure out how to insure our buses when we had buses and other things we were doing uh, walk across America in 92. So Michael's uh, uh, professional life as well as his uh, political life sometimes overlaps very well. So I would always that's, appreciate his work. That's always rewarding to me to be able to help yeah. out. Yeah. And right, actually, well, CCAC, actually CCAC was probably one of the early citizen groups that try to get a uh, citizens initiative go through uh, city council. And we met the same kind of maneuvering and political gamemanship that uh, uh, Seabor is doing right now. But we got 11,000 signatures together to get a nuclear free zone for uh, and, and, and economic uh, diversity, uh, diversification and conversion project going through Columbus to start developing plans for when, like Rockwell, when it was shutting down, uh, how to convert it into a peaceful time. And, and other, other uh, entities like Ashland Chemical that was doing the cruise missile uh, fuel, uh, they were doing fuel research, Battelle doing cruise and uh, guidance missile uh, uh, technology. All that course, was going course, on. And we had a lot of actions out at, at Rockwell when they were and, doing the B-1 true. bomber. Uh, yep. We, we were always creative in our uh, actions. Uh, we, we took a, a, a tree to be planted up to uh, Ashland Chemical. We had a, yes. a, a mock uh, missile that we carried and went, went to their front door and said, well, we, we have a gift for you. We'd like you to plant, a, plant this tree on your property as a sign of peace. And they, you know, a lot of times they don't know how to react to things like that. So in activism, you have to be creative. We, we went out to uh, the um, uh, Rickenbacker one time mm -hmm. and they were having the war games, which we thought, 
that uh, that wasn't a very good idea. So a group of us got together and made a banner that said, huge long banner, multiple sheets said, war is not a game to entertain. And went out on the runway and unfurled this banner and, and ran into the, the military police who came out and you know they were starting to you know take take the banner and I said to them I said well I, I'm sure you have a form to give us as a receipt for a banner I mean you can't just take it you have to give us a receipt well you know the military mind and all the paperwork and everything so they were all had to have huddle and go in a group be flexed. In, in the meantime <laughs> we we kept kept our banner out in front of the reviewing platform for quite a while while they went yeah. It actually did come back with a form <laughs> that gave us a receipt for confiscating our banner <laughs> and told us <laughs> we could come back and uh, collect it later. So that's yeah, just that, another that, sideline. There, that's thank you. Yeah, that that those are great reflections. I was part of all that stuff. You know, it was uh, <laughs> good good experiences to see the, the the different aspects, the different points of conflict. Uh, of war making that Columbus, it was early in our days of when we were starting to think about Columbus in the world, world in Columbus, which is a program that the World Council, uh, the Council of World Affairs has now taken on uh, to, to, to look at how much Columbus's uh, organizational industry had input and impact on the globe. And uh, from Oasis Foundation, uh, uh, fountains, water fountains to Patel to Rockwell, all those. So um, yeah, Columbus has a role to be active in Ohio, to be active in Columbus, Ohio does have global impact. And we do need to continue to have that voice where we can uh, organize people and address global concerns on a local basis. Um, so that's why we're sort of asking that question, peace and democracy, do we have either in the United States at this time? People always want to say we're the greatest country in the world, but uh, we, got some, we got some work to do, folks. We got some work to do. Um, really appreciate the, the uh, reflections. Thanks, Michael. What is this, Stephen, you just sent out? This is the program, oh, that's this, the program this, guide. This is for, the program guide, which I just yeah. finished on Tuesday night and took to the Fantastic. printer on Wednesday. <laughs> wow, all right. So we know Compass is going to be live this year. And so take that time to be out there and involve yourselves. Um, who knows? Maybe we'll have some kind of, we, we did a peace protest out of there one time. Candy didn't like it too much, but we, did, we took over High Street <laughs> a few years ago, about right when the, the Iraq war was about to start. Uh, we had several hundred people walk out of the Compass and onto High Street and locked it down for a good hour plus. Uh, I'm not calling for that again because Candy got mad at us, but um, I'm just saying we can do actions inside of the park to really reflect uh, a, 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 an understanding that we are three days of peace, music, and what's the other one? Peace, music, and fun, basically. Um, and, uh, my favorite one was when Ruben had a speaking slot at the jazz stage that year yeah yes. and he he took advantage to not make it just a, a, a stale talk up on a stage but brought in bunches of people carrying signs and singing and chanting and it, yeah. it was uh, uh you know yes. really gained uh, the attention of the crowd <laughs> yes yes yeah thanks Stephen. it was peace love and music that's right so yeah there's uh there's ways to use the Compass to really impact people. Some of these young folks that come to Compass are, are just there for the party, but without the purpose, that sort of cuts down the idea of what Compass is. It's a party with purpose. And so we really under, have to understand and bring that purpose into the Compass intentionally every time, because so often it can be um, overlooked the purpose of why Compass came into being in the first place. You know, it came out of the, the days of the early uh, of uh, Earth Day. It came out of the protests that happened because of Vietnam uh, War, where uh, the, the whole campus had been shut down because of the military's occupation of, of Ohio State campus and well, uh, many and other- 
people were organizing back in 72 to, you know, where we say, well, the city's not doing this, the city's not doing that. Well, people came together in 72 and formed the tenants union, uh, yes. food co-op, yes. uh, you know, women against rape, uh, all, all sorts of community-based action-oriented organizations that were providing for the community to give yes. what, what the city officials weren't doing. And I guess yes. maybe we, we don't do as much of that today where we just say, okay, city, city's not doing it. Uh, let's, let's find a way and, and do it from the grassroots. Yeah. Well, there are people doing that. It's just uh, how, can, how can some of the more now established <laughs> uh, peace heads of Comfest and others, you know, that it's, some of those folks are, you know, mid 70s plus uh, are starting to get to that point of, there's, there's a new organization across the country called uh, Radical Elders. A lot of these folks have been part of the May 1st movements and other uh, Puerto Rican independence movements and other folks. But start listening out for the, what they're going to do. They're, they're starting to put together, they have an organization that has 150 members right now across the country and, and including Puerto Rico. But um, starting to look at how do elders translate and, and transform uh, for the knowledge of all their work in the past of how and what, you know, we're not saying that, you know, just because we've done it before, we're, we're the, the only ones that can do anything, but the young folks do need some guidance and some help and, and support and, and how to develop infrastructure and, 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 and uh, organizational strength to, to express what they, their, these issues, these current issues that really are issues that have been going on for a long, long time. And we're looking at, you know, possibly at the end of this month, uh, going back to 1972, even. I mean, if you really think about it, we're going back to 1972. Uh, I love the sign at one of the rallies recently said it's uh, four o'clock in the morning in Tokyo. It's six o'clock in some other time. And then it's back in 1972 in the United States. Uh, so <laughs> it's like, where are we going with some of this stuff? It's, it's, we're, we're, you know, democracy is, is definitely under assault and um, we really uh, need folks to start uh, re-engaging. And uh, yeah, the COVID slowed a lot of things down, but that now is the time to start re-engaging and start really understanding how we can be about peace and democracy. I'm, I'm almost to a point of saying that maybe we need to start a people's party uh, for peace and, and democracy. And, and yeah, I know we have working families, we've got other organizations out there, but you know, one that really brings forth the, the demand for cutting military budget is not there. The Greens have it sort of, working parties doesn't have, working families party doesn't have that as their agenda. There's others out there that are really uh, sort of not addressing that subject. And we really need to, as we did, it was a challenge back in 1980, 81, 82. We went to the freeze, National Freeze Conference in Denver. There were about half of us that about walked out of that conference because they did not want to bring in human needs. Cutting uh, money, uh, cutting, cutting military to fund human needs. That resolved itself peacefully and through democratic action in the convention. But that, that, that continues to be a problem in, in the U.S. Uh, uh, organizing uh, may lose uh, the environment. We, we don't have a clear definition of, you know, a lot of people say, well, we can't afford that, but guess what? We can afford seven wars going on at the same time. We can afford the largest, a trillion dollar military budget. We can afford that stuff, but we can't afford to pay uh, people minimum wage. Come on now, our living wage. We can't have the families making a wage that's going to support their families. Come on, there, there's some mix up here. So, um, Michael, again, thank you for your contribution over the years and also many other things. I don't know if uh, I haven't seen too many people post anything. Um, yeah, uh, Rick, you, you talked about Supreme Court uh, last week. Yeah, yeah, the right to appeal. Yeah, the, a lot of those, um, we're, we're definitely in, a, in an uphill battle right now. We don't have the, the third good marshals on this court now. We don't. We don't have the uh, good, strong uh, potentials to look for um, 
liberation in the Supreme Court. Uh, it's not going to happen through the courts as we talk right now. And um, we need to really try to figure out other avenues. And, you know, from the very beginning, the Roe versus Wade was, was a, a, a decision that was able to be evaporated quickly. As soon as the court changed, boom, it's gone, just like it is being to be gone. So uh, we need to really discuss. So Stephen, do you see some people that want a question? I see. Yeah, yes, I was going to say something real quick. Um, Please. I don't know if you can coordinate a confess, have all the stages at one time talk to each other. You have people with walkie talkies coordinate all the stages and say, OK, at three o'clock Saturday afternoon, we're going to have everybody at confess say peace and maybe repeat it so that it's a coordinated thing and so that the whole city will hear it. If not, it'll reverberate around the globe, literally. I mean, you know, the planet's only 8,000 miles in diameter. It ain't that much. Possible? Maybe. It'll be an experiment? Maybe. It'll be a, a record for the books? Who knows? But a number, of, a number of years ago, we actually uh, you know, had, we formed a human peace sign where yeah. people all got together in the park and uh, you know formed a human peace sign, which I forget which year it was, but uh, you know that that was a, a good action. We don't have any really yeah. good communication between all the stages. There's no uh, common uh, co connection there. But you guys have walkie-talkies. I mean, you have everybody's. We do. We do have walkie-talkies. So, in some way, you could, and maybe. Get Candy in on it. She might be really enthused about it. You know, tell her Caruso told, gave her old marching orders. <laughs> but Marilyn said, Marilyn said she she was wondering what happened to the peace dividend. You know, after the Cold War, it's like nothing. It evaporated, right? Suzanne has her hand up too. Oh, I was just wondering if people on this call would, would be interested in speaking at the stage, because you mentioned, Michael, you didn't have enough people speaking on the stage. How would they get a hold of somebody or arrange to speak on the stage? At, at, at this stage, pardon the pun, we're, it's, we, I'd need to hear from people really quickly uh, and see if we could plug people in. I mean, we people were reaching out, trying to find others to speak. and. I yeah. wonder about Bill Lyons, Jonathan Beard, Mary Jane Borden, um, even you, Mark. I mean, there's a lot of people on this call that have things to say. Um, so I don't know. It just occurred to me that maybe they could just email you right now or put something in yeah, the you could. chat right now to let you know they'd be interested in it. So I don't know, Bill, Jonathan, anybody yeah, else? Yeah, I'd be interested. I don't know uh, his uh, email address, I don't believe. Well, but, you could... Uh, I said the one, which is safety at comfest.com or michael.gruber, G R U B E R, at comfest.com. And there's also uh, Gary, Winnie that was talking about a death penalty. Well, yeah, I, I tried to get Gary to do that. And it, usually Gary would be uh, at a conference, I think, or something in, in uh, DC almost every, every year, the same weekend as Comfest. So, Winnie, Winnie, are you hearing us? Could she just put something in the, uh, she doesn't seem to be listening, but she just put something in the chat about asking if somebody could speak about the death penalty. Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, there's email, Joe Motel right here on the call too. E email me yeah. and I'll, I'll see what slots are still open and we can, uh, we can work on that because we, you know, we Selena, had that, had that Travis. stage. Travis said he'll speak. Believe us and tra tra yeah, there's a lot of people on this call. I think you could fill up some of those slots. You can pull Bob out of the closet and stick him up there and throw a mic at him. <laughs> he, he, well, he would, any, anybody he would that's tend a, to talk for a longer period of time. Though. Yeah, anyone that's available to speak, get on the confess.com and uh, try, to, try to make that communication before no, the end he, of this week. Email me directly. Okay. Hey, Michael, so, how many how many minutes are you talking about if somebody speaks? It's uh, roughly. It would, could be like ten minutes. Oh, okay. Ten. It's while 20, it's while the bands are setting up. Okay. It's while the bands are setting yeah, up. Yeah, you know, in between. Why, one's tearing down and the other one's coming in. Well, right. we have we actually have you know set aside speaker times. 
It's yeah. if, if you'll go to compass.com and look at the uh, program guide, you'll see what times there's speakers that say TBD. <laughs> That's where we don't have speakers. We, we were going to try, quite up. There's try and, quite a few of those TBDs try and right fill now. Fill it with you know, old Comfesters telling stories, but I'd rather hear from community orgs. <laughs> Mike, can you give us your email again? It's Michael dot Gruber, G R U B E R at Comfest.com. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Michael. You're going right, to put that in, you. Stephen? You yeah, I'll try. In, uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Check it. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it right there. Yep. Well, thanks, everybody. That, that was great. Anybody got any uh, other words of wisdom as we're, we're getting past eight o'clock right now? And I just wanted to know uh, if, uh, so, you know, we're, we're at a point in this global history that is going to uh, mark us for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, maybe. Um, the Supreme Court is one such thing. There's other avenues that are going to really start um, limiting what and where we're at. And we, you know, places and things that we thought were set are going to have to be battled for again. Uh, and beyond that, so as we start thinking about what is democracy, that means people taking charge and being being the rulers, right? They're, they're the ones that are in charge. Um, so we need to really try to understand. Okay, yeah. Um, what what it takes to alter the political balance of power? Okay. Political science talk about balance of power all the time. They talk in, in, in a military sense, but it also is in a political sense of how do you create power and overtake uh, the structure that is in place. Uh, Jonathan and Bill talking about the power structures that downtown, you know, in City Hall has. And another time where you could be down there with all these uh, players will be uh, this coming week when they're doing the uh, turn into the city hall orange because of the violence and uh, really go down there and start talking to they're going to be down there so we're down there and touch and breathe the same air as them as uh, it's gone 13th uh, when they're turning city hall into an orange light because of they're saying that's against violence um you know they're, they're good at propagating those kind of messages but what did they actually end up doing you know, politics, you know, they're talking about this uh, group violence uh, intervention now uh, coming in from Boston and, and Oakland. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. And they're throwing a lot of money at things right now. Uh, some of them are going to some good organizations. Some are sort of going to some organizations sort of wonder if they're actually going to end up doing what they're supposed to be doing. So uh, again, Thank you. I I'm wanted to double check. Yeah, go ahead, please. Okay. Um, pending anything else happening in the meantime, the next salon on July 9th is going to be in person again at our house in the backyard. Woo! So um, <laughs> it doesn't mean we're done with the Zoom. It just means at least in this July, you know, weather that we hope holds out. We'll have one in our backyard and I'll send the usual email out about it to let people know if it's going to be the usual time, 6.30 to 11 or when it, exactly it's going to be. But at any yeah, so, so to so be clear, person, July, July and August, we're talking about possibly doing live salons, but then in September coming back to doing the, the uh, online stuff. So uh, we don't have too many details yet about August, but July 9th. We're going to have act. We're going to have an actual salon in the backyard of, of Bob and Suzanne. Thank you again. Uh, and that's twenty or ten twenty one ten twenty one East Broad Street in the back of their of their household. So please join us. It'll be great to see people in live. We're going to have uh, music and and uh, good time together. So, and if and if anybody thanks, wants Suzanne. to help us by coming over a little early, which I'll put this word out too to help us set it up, that would be. 
extremely uh, appreciated. Yes, yes, it would be. Thank you.